You've probably heard of the case of Tara Grinstead, a high school teacher who went missing in 2005. Tara was 30 years old and she taught at Irwin County High School in Osceola, Georgia. On October 22, 2005, she vanished without a trace. I have followed this case over the years because when this happened, I lived in a town not too far away. I lived in the town where Tara went to college. Tifton, Georgia, where Tara had once won the title of Miss Tifton and gone on to compete in the Miss Georgia pageant, was only a few exits up the interstate from where I lived. At the time, I worked as a substitute teacher in the school system there. I never taught a class at the high school where Tara had been a teacher. When I started as a sub, Tara had already gone missing. I remember how deeply it affected the area, not just with fear and panic, but also with heartbreak. Tara was loved by many and everyone wanted to know what happened to her. It took 12 years to find out. The day that Tara went missing was a Saturday, October 22, 2005. On this day, there was the Miss Sweet Potato pageant. I mentioned earlier that Tara was a former beauty pageant contestant who had actually competed in the Miss Georgia pageant. On the day of the Miss Sweet Potato pageant, Tara was helping some contestants get ready at her house something that she did often and her students loved her for. At about 5 p.m., she left her house to go to the pageant, which was in the nearby Fitzgerald Grand Theater. From there, this is what we know about the rest of Tara's evening. About 7 p.m., she left the pageant and stopped by her friend's house briefly. Around 8 p.m., she went to a barbecue cookout at another friend's house, a friend named Troy Davis. While she was there, Tara did receive at least one phone call. At about 11 p.m., her friend Troy walked her to her car and Tara headed home, and this was the last sighting of her that night. The next day, on Sunday the 23rd, Tara's friends and family hadn't been able to get in touch with her. On Monday morning, the 24th, Tara didn't show up for work at the school. She hadn't called in and she hadn't scheduled a substitute teacher, which would have only taken her a few minutes to do. I can tell you as someone who worked as a sub in the Georgia school system that it was mostly online done through a system where all you had to do was log on and request that you needed a sub and it was done last minute all the time. I would get notices you know, 30 minutes before school started saying can you come in and teach this class. So they definitely knew something was wrong when she just didn't show up and no one had heard from her and she had not made arrangements for anyone to cover her classes. So her co-workers called the police, and this began the investigation. Tara was not at her house, even though her car was still parked there. The car was unlocked, and inside it was an envelope that contained $100, which some people who knew her found to be strange. There were no apparent signs of forced entry, or a break-in, or an obvious robbery. This immediately raised the question of whether Tara had left on her own, left willingly with someone she knew, or if she had let someone that she knew into her home. Inside her house, Tara's cell phone was still there. It looked like she may have been in bed at some point. There were still things in her home that had been left around by the girls who had been there getting ready for the pageant, but the house phone was found on the bathroom floor. Her alarm clock was underneath her bed and blinking as if it had been reset or unplugged or possibly broken. There was a broken lamp next to her bed, and the police also found a broken necklace um, where the, the chain or the clasp was broken. It was also odd that Tara's dog was there, left out in the backyard. There was a business card who had been left in her front door, and it belonged to a police officer from a nearby town. The clothes that Tara had worn that Saturday were there at the house, and her house had been locked. The police also found a latex glove in her front yard. The glove did turn out to have a DNA sample as well as some fingerprints. The searches for Tara began that night, but there was no sign of her. Investigators interviewed her acquaintances, including her ex-boyfriend who had an alibi and the man whose business card had been left in the front door of Tara's house who also had an alibi. Investigators looked into a former student of Tara's who had been arrested at her house one evening for disorderly conduct when he had been banging on her door and trying to get in. It had been said that this former student had some sort of obsession with Tara 
he had claimed that they had a relationship for a couple of years. This particular student was given a polygraph test and submitted DNA for a match with the glove and was ultimately ruled out. Investigators considered a suicide theory because Tara had been upset about the recent breakup with her ex-boyfriend, but with no body being found, that was unlikely. It's hard to commit suicide and hide your body after the fact. They also considered the theory of her possibly running away or leaving everything behind on her own, but what she actually left behind, like her cell phone and her car and some money, made it unlikely that that is what happened as well. So from the beginning, police thought that foul play was most likely what had happened. They chose some information and evidence details to hold back, to help with their investigation later. This case was everywhere, believe me. I remember even civilians just trying to figure out what happened or where Tara could be. Her case was kept alive online. It was featured on television, on various shows over the years, but eventually the leads kind of started to go cold. And in 2010, Tara was declared legally dead. In 2016, a new podcast called Up and Vanished helped bring renewed attention to Tara's case, which is the largest case file and missing person case in Georgia history. Up and Vanished podcast even ended up becoming a television show on the Oxygen channel. Then in 2017, arrests were finally made in this case. A tip came in to the GBI from a woman who was the girlfriend of a former student of Tara's. The name of the former student was Bo Dukes. Bo Dukes' girlfriend, whose name was Brooke, called in this tip and said that Bo had told her that his friend Ryan had killed Tara. Bo said that he had helped his friend get rid of Tara's body. His friend's name was Ryan Duke, and he was also a former student of Tara's. Although their last names sound alike, the two men are not related, but they had been close friends in high school. Bo had also told his girlfriend that they had taken Tara's body to a pecan orchard and burned it. Investigators interviewed both Bo Dukes and Ryan Duke, and they both apparently gave statements that could be considered confessions. Bo Duke's story was that the night Tara went missing, he was asleep at home, and the next morning, on Sunday the 23rd, Ryan woke him up and told him that he had killed Tara the night before, and he'd taken Bo's truck to Tara's house and used it to take Tara's body from there to a pecan orchard that was owned by Bo's family. Both men were then arrested in 2017, Ryan Duke was charged with murder, actually felony murder, aggravated assault, and I believe a concealment charge. Bo Dukes was charged with two counts of giving false statements, hindering apprehension, which would have been hindering the apprehension of Ryan because he had known that Ryan had committed this murder, evidence tampering, which was destruction of the body, and concealing the death of another. Indictments against the men basically allege that Ryan Duke broke into Tara's home and used his hands to kill her. Then the two men dumped and burned her body in the pecan orchard. Ryan allegedly gave a version of events that basically describes what happened as he broke into Tara's house, drunk and high, to steal money for drugs, and that she caught him and he hit her and she died as a result of that, but that he did not mean to kill her. He claimed he left her house to call her from a payphone and that when she didn't answer, he thought that that must mean that she was dead. There was a phone call that was made to Tara's house that evening from a payphone, and it was one of the details of the investigation that the police had withheld from the public. So this seemed to give corroboration to Ryan's story, or at least this part of it. Ryan said that he then went back to Tara's house, assuming at this point that she's dead, with latex gloves and a quilt wrapped her body up and put it in Bo Duke's truck and drove her body out to the pecan orchard to dump it, and that later on, they returned to move the body to a different place in the orchard and burn it. Ryan Duke has no significant criminal history aside from a DUI that he got in 2010. When he got this DUI, he was speeding and driving without a license out on Tipton Highway. Bo Dukes, on the other hand, has served two years in prison for theft. He stole $50,000 worth of goods from the Army with his wife in 2013 when he was a unit supply specialist. He had been released from prison in 2015 and ordered to attend AA meetings for one year. He also got into more trouble just before he was due to go to court for Tara's case earlier this year in 2019. On New Year's Day, 
Two women claimed that they were sexually assaulted at gunpoint by Bo Dukes in his home in Warner Robins, Georgia. They say that he held them against their will in his home and raped them and that then they escaped. When a warrant was issued for Bo Dukes' arrest, he fled. The warrant was for rape, aggravated sodomy, false imprisonment, and possession of a firearm by a felon. The police put out a bolo for his vehicle and a description of what he was wearing, and there was basically a manhunt for four days. They ended up catching him in Osceola, Georgia at a relative's house. At some point, Bo did take investigators out to the pecan orchard to try to show them the place where they burned Tara's body. When Bo went to trial, we learned that they had actually found bone fragments, and these bone fragments showed evidence of having been burned. During the trial, a video of an interview Bo gave to investigators was played and entered as evidence. In this interview, in this interview, he said the night Tara disappeared, he had a party at his trailer, got drunk, and passed out, and that the next day, Ryan told him that he had killed Tara while he was trying to rob her, and that he had used Bo's truck to take her body to Bo's family's pecan orchard. Bo says that when Ryan first told him this, he didn't believe him or take him seriously. But on Monday, when he saw Tara was reported missing, he started to believe Ryan. Then on that Wednesday, he says that Ryan drove him out to the body in the pecan orchard. Bo describes what Tara's body looked like. He describes her as being nude, covered in ants, that she was wearing a belly button ring, and that he didn't see any wounds or blood other than marks around her neck. He said the marks looked more like they had been made by hand than by being strangled with a ligature. Bo said he took Tara's body by the arms and Ryan took her by her legs and that this is how they carried her into Bo's truck. They then drove her body to a different spot in the pecan orchard and began to cover her with pecan wood. Bo admits that it was his idea to use the pecan wood to cover her and burn her. He says that they used four to five truckloads of the wood and that they covered her so much that you couldn't see any of her body anymore underneath the pile. The next day, on Thursday, Bo said they went back to check on the body and the progress of the burning. He said at this point it was burned down to bones, and he describes it as seeing just bones and he thought they might have been ribs. He says it took two days to burn the body. The bone fragments that were found in the pecan orchard were skull fragments, spine fragments, hand fragments, and a tooth. Ryan had also been taken to the pecan orchard with investigators at some point, and he allegedly pointed out the same general area as Bo had for the burn spot. Bo said Ryan had told him that he had gotten into bed with Tara and strangled her. Bo also said Ryan told him he didn't use gloves, which doesn't make sense because the latex glove was found in Tara's yard. That glove had DNA that matched two people, Tara and Ryan Duke. Two fingerprints from the glove also matched Ryan. There were three fingerprints total. Two of them matched Ryan, and the third was insufficient for a conclusion. There were witnesses who testified at Bo's trial that they had heard Bo or Ryan or both speak out about what they had done. Jake Dukes, Bo's brother, testified that Bo did tell him that Ryan had said he'd killed Tara and that Bo also told him that he had helped cover it up. He said he didn't know why Ryan did it, that Ryan never said why, but that Bo went along with it because Ryan had used Bo's truck and Bo's family orchard, and Bo was afraid that Ryan would pin it on him, and that Ryan had threatened to do so. One of the witnesses was someone who knew Bo and Ryan from high school, and he testified that at a party not long after Tara went missing, he heard Bo and Ryan make a statement about burning Tara's body. Another witness was a man who knew Bo from the army. He testified that Bo had told him about helping Ryan get rid of Tara's body by burning it. Bo's defense argued that all of the prosecution's evidence was just Bo's statements and witness statements and that no physical evidence actually linked him to the crime. It is true that none of the DNA or fingerprints were matched to Bo. They all matched Ryan. The defense claimed that Bo's statements were not reliable because so much time had passed and that his memory wasn't reliable, basically. Ryan Duke now gives a different story. His alibi is that he was the one who was asleep at home the night Tara went missing. He says his brother Stephen was there along with Bo Dukes and another friend Ben McMahon. Ryan claims that Bo and Ben McMahon were the ones who left the house in the early morning hours. Ben McMahon died in 2014, so he's not here to corroborate that or discredit it or to defend himself if Ryan is implying that Ben had something to do with Tara's death. Ryan is basically trying to pin it on Bo. Ryan has also said that he had a relationship with Tara on and off since high school, but that the night he broke into her house, nothing sexual took place. 
He says there was no sexual assault or activity, but Bo said to investigators that he wasn't sure he believed Ryan about that part. Bo said Ryan told him he used a card to get into Tara's front door, such as using a credit card to slide the locks open, but I've seen at least one friend of Tara's say that she had multiple locks on her door, which would make Ryan's story seem more doubtful. It would be harder to break in using a plastic card with multiple locks, and at the very least, it would take a longer amount of time to do it, and would also possibly make more noise in the process. Wouldn't Tara's dog have begun to bark during that process? One theory is that Ryan's telling the truth about having some sort of relationship with Tara, and that would make her likely to let him into the house. Her clothes that she had worn that day had been taken off and left in the room, and Bo also described her body as nude when he saw it, so if they were involved, that would all fit in. It's possible something just turned violent at some point. There's also the possibility that she'd just taken off her clothes to get into bed and then Ryan did come into her home and find her that way or she caught him doing something. Another theory is just that she knew him enough to be familiar with him and would let him in her house, but that they weren't romantically or sexually involved. In that case, though, I'd be more inclined to think that she would get dressed in some way before letting him come inside the house. Maybe he wanted a relationship and made advances, but she didn't and she resisted them and things went bad from there. There was blood found on Tara's comforter. It was another piece of evidence that investigators had initially held back from the public, but it wasn't enough blood to tell whether or not it came from a struggle or something violent or just something simple like a nosebleed or a period. There were small signs of a possible struggle in the house, like the broken lamp and the phone in the floor, like maybe she'd been trying to call for help, but there wasn't much missing or stolen to support Ryan's excuse of a robbery. The car was still there unlocked with all the cash in it. It would be unlikely that he would pick Tara's house randomly to rob just for drug money. He had to drive at least five miles from his house to hers, so there were other places along the way during that five miles that he could have chosen to randomly break into and rob. It seems almost certain that he picked Tara's house to go to deliberately, and the circumstances seem to fit less of a robbery gone bad scenario and more of a situation where they were either involved and something turned violent that night, or Ryan Duke wanted to be sexually involved with Tara and tried to make that happen. Because Ryan's claim is that he was trying to rob her and she woke up and caught him, he's charged with felony murder. That basically means that during the commission of a felony, which would have been the burglary, he committed a murder. A couple of other things that are still out there as odd unexplained details are the fact that Tara's driver's seat was pushed back almost all the way and she was only 5 foot 3. People who knew her said that her seat was moved too far back to be how she would normally drive. There is also the matter of Tara's dog being left out in the backyard. People who knew her thought it was unusual and that she wouldn't have left the dog out all night, and it was pointed out that the dog should have barked at an intruder or a break-in or a violent struggle. Ryan Duke's alibi seems to have fallen apart because his brother is now saying he cannot say for sure that Ryan was home all night and didn't leave the night Tara disappeared. With McMahon deceased, that only leaves Bo and Ryan who were in the house and they are giving conflicting statements accusing each other. Some people do wonder if Bo had more involvement in this than he's admitted to. It's common that even when someone confesses to a crime, they tend to minimize their involvement. It was Bo's vehicle that was used, Bo's family's property where the body was burned, and Bo has the more violent criminal history. It's also more difficult for one person to move a dead body alone. Ryan Duke now claims when he gave his statements he was on drugs and his statements aren't reliable. He says he thought his friends had turned on him and were pinning it on him and that he just took the rap and gave up, but that it's really Bo who did it. Ryan was supposed to go to trial April 1st, 2019. But his trial has been postponed because his lawyers are seeking funds for his defense investigation. Where the case stands right now is that a hearing about these requested defense funds is set for May 7, 2019. Bo Dukes was convicted of all four counts that he has gone to trial for so far. One count of hindering apprehension, two counts giving false statements, and one count of concealing the death of another. He received the maximum sentence, which is 25 years. 
he still has another charge to go to court for, the charge of the destruction of Tara's body. Because the destruction of her body happened in a different county than the other charges, the actual murder, he has to have a separate trial in a different county, unless he decides to plead guilty or take a deal. So for now, the case isn't finished. There will be more court dates and you can follow the case along as it happens. There's a local news station that did a great job covering the case and Bo Duke's trial, and they have a streaming video from the trial in the courtroom. I'll put a link to that in the sources in the description below the video, as well as other sources. I'll probably post updates for this case, so if you'd like to come back and follow it with us, subscribe to our channel. We'd love to have you join us. In this case, I think we do know what happened to Tara Grinstead, and I think we do know who was responsible. Some questions may remain as to the extent of Bo's involvement or maybe even Ryan's, but both of these men are responsible and I believe we have gotten answers in this case and the right men are being held accountable for it. I hope that can bring some solace and resolution to Tara's friends and family. Thank you as always for checking in with us and if you have any thoughts about the case or questions, comments, or anything you'd like to share, please do so and hit subscribe and come back and join us for our next case.